why don't we get started? So today we are going to close the loop on um, synaptic transmission. We're talking about neural communication. Again, the, the real bread and butter of the entire nervous system. I really want you to understand these concepts because we're going to use these concepts as a base for all the higher level um, um, systems that we're going to talk about from the sensory systems to the motor systems to higher cognitive learning, memory, and emotion systems. We talked about the first part of electrical transmission. Today we're going to finish up um, electrical transmission and, and then finish the lecture with chemical properties and neurotransmitters. Okay, so as we talked about last time, there are two types of communication that happen in neurons. Electrical, um, that happens within the neurons, starting from the dendrites up here all the way down to the axons, and then chemical transmission that happens at the synapse between the axon terminal of one neuron and the um, dendrites or cell body of the next neuron. Sorry, let me get my pointer. So electrical happening all through here from the dendrites all the way down and then chemical from the axon terminals to uh, the postsynaptic terminals on the next cell right here. Now last week, uh, or sorry, Monday, we talked about resting membrane potential, just what causes the neuron to be at a negative potential at rest. And we also talked about what is happening during an action potential. The action potential originates where in the neuron? What is that special spot called where it's originating? Axon hillock, very good. And that's happening right here. So we talked about action potentials generated right here at the axon hillock. And what we're going to do next is talk about how that action potential generated right here gets all the way down here, because that's where it needs to get to. And then what we're going to jump back to is a question that was already asked at the uh, end of last lecture. That is, I talked about uh, uh, changes in the membrane potential that get the membrane to threshold. But what does that, what exactly is happening there? We're then going to look at the electrical, what's called potentials, that are happening here in the input part of the cell that are changing the membrane potential that can either hyperpolarize the membrane, and no action potential is happening there, or can depolarize it where you start getting your action potentials. So let's talk about first um, kind of communication and transmission down the axon. Oh, sorry. Uh, before I do that, I just want to remind you uh, uh, what we went over, uh, just a couple of points about the action potential itself. Here is the heart of the action potential. Can anybody tell me what is the key channel that is um, causing this huge depolarization of the neuron? What channel do I need to get that depolarization? Yes. Sodium. Any particular kind of sodium channel? Yes. Voltage-gated sodium channel, perfect. Okay, so we have voltage-gated sodium channels coming up here, and then we get this, this uh, um, uh, uh, kind of uh, hyperpolarization here, uh, a rebound effect, if you will. What was happening down here? What channel is important for that? Another special channel that we talked about. Yes. The voltage-gated potassium channel, perfect. So we have voltage-gated sodium channels that cause the depolarization, and then to compensate and get that potential back down um, to uh, a hyperpolarized state, we have the voltage-gated uh, potassium channels that are then hyperpolarizing the membrane. We go back to rest, and what did I talk about uh, right here? Now we have kind of a lot of sodium uh, inside the cell. That's not the normal state. And um, we have potassium that left the cell. What is that um, uh, mechanism that I talked about to put things back to uh, uh, resting state? Yes. Perfect. The sodium potassium pump. That's where the sodium potassium pump comes in. Fantastic. So uh, you guys are all following all those uh, uh, series of steps here. So now we are again at the axon hillock and we're trying to get the action potentials down here. Okay. Important concept to understand is that action potentials are regenerated along the axon 
such that each adjacent section is depolarized and a new action potential occurs. So as if there's little clusters of those voltage-gated sodium channels. One cluster opens, you get an action potential, oh, and, it, and then it, um, uh, um, it opens the next cluster of sodium channels, you get an action potential generated in the next little chunk of axon right next door. Important concept, act, oops, action potentials travel only in one direction. Why? Because of the refractory state of the membrane after depolarization. Remember we talked about there is an absolute refractory period. This, it's actually this chunk of the, um, the axon cannot uh, get depolarized again for a, a small amount of time after an action potential is seen, and then there's a relative refractory period. So when we're actually recording from our flat little neuron right here, we're stimulating right at the axon hillock, the sensitive part of uh, the neuron, and then we're recording at three different points down the axon, okay? So we stimulate, let's see, right here at time zero, and at time one, we see the action potential passing by this blue electrode right here, because it's the one closest to the axon hillock. And then a little time later, we see it passing by uh, the purple um, electrode, and then finally the green electrode. We don't see this blue electrode uh, activated again. Once it passes in this direction, it does not come back. Why is that? Because, let's say this is the sodium channels being um, activated right here, this whole chunk of neuron, uh, sorry, of axon is refractory. For just a, a split second of a neuroscience, uh, of a neuroscience, of a millisecond, um, as the sodium channels are propagating and being activated further and further away. So once this chunk of axon is ready to be potentiated again, the, the uh, potassium uh, um, kind of bursts of of depolarization is far away and does not activate this again, okay? So that's why the action potential is only propagated in one direction rather than ping-ponging back and forth, going up and down and up and down, re-exciting um, those voltage-gated sodium channels. And it's because of the refractory period. Refractory period is just has to do with the nature of how these voltage-gated sodium channels work. They open, and then they simply shut down again. Again, going back to our um, uh, toilet uh, flush analogy. If you flush once, there's a period where you simply can't flush again. That's exactly what we're seeing in the, um, in the, uh, volt for the voltage-gated sodium channels. Yes? So how exactly do the different parts of the axon know to open up their voltage-gated sodium channels? Well, that's a really good question. And the answer is that, again, there is one key point where the voltage-gated sodium channels are open, uh, sorry, are, are most sensitive, and that is at the axon hillock. And uh, there's a huge concentration of voltage-gated sodium channels. And, um, what I think the answer to that question is going to come in a little while when we get to how we reach threshold. I think your question really gets at how do we reach threshold that activates it here. You understand how once it's activated here, it propagates only in one direction. Yeah? Okay. So let me get back to that question in the, in the second part of this first section of the talk. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, great. So we have our refractory period, we have our axon, our action potentials moving only in one direction, down the axon. And now we're, I need to talk to you about conduction velocity. The term conduction velocity means the speed of propagation of action potentials. And that conduction speed varies with the diameter of the axon. Big Big old honking axons have very faster um, um, conduction velocities, and tiny little thin ones have, um, um, have uh, much slower conduction velocities. Now, last time we saw a film of uh, a creature that had a giant axon. What creature was that? Giant squid. And so uh, what's happening there is that um, uh, invertebrates uh, tend to have very thin uh, very slow neurons. For example, uh, um, animals like a newt. A newt 
pretty much just sits there. I had a friend that had a pet, pet newt, and he just loved this newt because he didn't have to feed it, and it didn't do anything. Kind of a boring, boring pet, but it didn't do anything because his axons were, were very, very thin, unmyelinated. Um, but, but a squid, and even a newt sometimes, has to uh, get away from danger. How do they do that? What they do is they save up all their energy, and they build one big, fat, huge, um, uh, high diameter, large diameter axon, and they use that for emergency situations. What did we say that those giant axons were being used for? When they stimulated it, what, did, what happened? It, it, it uh, contracted. Motor movement, important for fast um, uh, uh, fleeing from a predator, for example. There's not a lot of these big axons, but, um, uh, but they have a few of them, and they're used for emergency situations. Okay, so that are, those are invertebrates. They have lots of unmyelinated axons and some big unmyelinated axons for emergency situations where they have to move quickly. Now we're going to move to yet another form, uh, a way to speed up uh, conduction velocity in a neuron. And that is what we already talked about. That is the coating of myelin, the myelin sheets. The oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells, you remember from our second lecture, were the subcategory of glia cells that produce myelin, either in the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system. And we talked about the fact that the myelin kind of wraps around the axons in, in little chunks, exposing one tiny little bit of the axon. That little bit of exposed axon is called the node of Ranvier, defined as small gaps in the insulating myelin sheath, this myelin made by oligodendrocytes or Schwann cells, depending on which part of the nervous system you're in. What happens at the node of Ranvier? The node of Ranvier, together with the um, uh, insulating myelin, allow for something called saltatory conduction. Saltatory means jumping. And so uh, what happens is uh, when you have uh, the myelin uh, coating and the nodes of Ranvier, the action potential in these myelinated axons uh, travel inside the axon, and the action potentials actually jump from one node of Ranvier to the next road, node of Ranvier. So um, in here is an unmyelinated axon, so the action has to, uh, sorry, the action potential has to be regenerated here, and then here, and then here, and then here. It's like if you had um, a, a lineup of match heads, and one match head lights up, and then it lights up the next one, next one, next one, next one, next one, and you get all the way down where that burst of flame is your action potential. Here, what we have is a myelin sheet. We have uh, the node of Ranvier that has lots of sodium, uh, voltage-gated sodium channels. You have a huge uh, um, action potential generated here. Um, that, uh, that action potential travels without generating another action potential to here where the action potential jumps to this next node of Ranvier and so on and so on. The analogy here is express train versus local train. Here, the action potential has to make all the stops. It's slow. You have to wait for the slow people to get out, the train's doors to close. And here is your express train, just going um, uh, down the same axon, but making many fewer stops where the door has to open. That is, the action potential has to open. You get your action potential, but then you jump to the next, um, the next um, uh, spot. And here you can see the difference in conduction speed in a rapid conduction uh, down a, a myelinated axon. You get conduction velocities of 150 meters per second. That is fast. Now think about fast things that we do. I don't know if anybody watched the uh, US Open. Those reflexes that the world-class tennis players have, what they're using is their myelinated axons to both visually see that tennis ball that's coming at over 100 miles an hour in the men's serves and using uh, the same myelinated axons to get the message from their primary motor cortex in their arms and the legs to get set up to be able to return that ball. That's what's happening. And you can go as fast as 150 meters per second. That contrast 
with our slow conduction velocity of unmyelinated axons that go as slow as 10 meters per second, okay? So it really speeds things up, and uh, it's really uh, the, the, um, the uh, production of myelin has really allowed us to go much faster and uh, do many more computations and, and think much more deeply and more quickly than invertebrates, for example. Uh, consider um, a newt versus a uh, gazelle, a mammalian gazelle. Very, very fast axon, axon conduction, also using um, myelinated axons. Now, let me just make clear one point. I told you about two different uh, non-exclusive ways that you can get faster or slower um, uh, conduction velocity. One is by the diameter of the axon itself. Either, whether it's myelinated or not, if you have smaller axons, your conduction is slow, and if you have bigger axons, your conduction is fast. The other way I told you you can speed things up is by adding myelin. So uh, adding myelin to a thin axon will make that um, axon go a little bit, sorry, the action potential and conduction velocity go faster, but ax adding myelin to a bigger axon will make it go even faster, okay? So it's, there's size, there's diameter of the axon that's controlling conduction velocity and the fact of whether it's myelinated or not. Okay, great. Now. Let's move into uh, the question that you asked over here. What is making the action potentials happen? And so what happens is, uh, here's the axon hillock here, and we're, we're focused um, in this, uh, uh, the first part of the lectures on resting potential, uh, resting potential but also mainly focused on the ax action potential and the axon hillock and the axon itself. What about the cell body and all these dendrites? That is the input structure of the cell. That is where all the information is coming in and it's being synthesized. And it's dependent on that kind of information, on that information coming in. That information is determining where and when and how many action potentials you get here. Let me explain that. So, these synapses, we're gonna talk about the chemical aspects of synapses. So here's a, sorry, here's a blow up of this. We have an axon terminal coming down and you're, you're uh, terminating on the cell body. Sometimes you're terminating on the dendrite here. You're giving input to the cell. And those inputs are causing electrical patterns of activity. Those electrical patterns of activity being generated here in the cell body and the dendrites. Not yet, we haven't reached the axon hillock yet. They're being generated in the cell bodies and the dendrites. Um, those uh, electrical changes are called postsynaptic potentials, and they're brief changes in the resting membrane potential. There are two flavors of postsynaptic potentials that you could, you could have um, at, at the cell body and dendrite. The first is excitatory. Excitatory postsynaptic potentials produce a small local depolarization, okay? Um, it pushes the cell closer uh, to threshold. It's going uh, from negative 60, you're going closer and closer to zero, trying to get to that threshold. And uh, these EPSPs, or excitatory postsynaptic potentials, are caused by opening of sodium channels on the postsynaptic membrane. There's not nearly as many sodium channels there, uh, but they're there, and the opening of those sodium channels um, in the dendrite and cell body causes a depolarization. Okay, the second kind of, um, the second kind of postsynaptic potential you could have is an inhibitory postsynaptic potential, an IPSP. This produces a small hyper Polarization. That means this kind of potential is making the membrane potential get even more negative, even harder to get an action potential generated. Um, and it pushes the cell farther away from threshold. Um, the IPSB results not from sodium channels opening, but from chloride um, channels opening. And chloride channels entering the cell, chloride is a negative um, ion, uh, making the inside of the cell more negative. 
Now, remember back to our uh, cute little diagram that we talked about when we were talking about resting membrane potential, where we know that there's lots of sodium, a little bit of potassium on the outside, lots of proteins on the inside, uh, lot, uh, lots of proteins on the inside, few on the outside. And I said, oh, you don't need to worry about uh, these uh, chloride and calcium. Well, I lied. You do need to know about them. And here is why you need to know about them. The chloride is important for the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And here we see at rest, there is lots of chloride on the outside and just a little bit on the inside. So when those chloride channels open during an IPSP, what will happen given this gradient? Yes? It would flow into the cell. Exactly. Why? Why would it flow into the cell when that channel is open? Right. There's, there's two reasons. One is just the uh, gradient of diffusion. You always flow from lots to little. Right? So when the, the window is closed, you can't go in, but when you're open, if there's not very many of you on the inside, you flow into the inside. Uh, but you can't flow too much because it's already negative in there. But you're flowing down your gradient. And that flow of um, chloride uh, is, is causing uh, the, the subtle uh, hyperpolarization that we're talking about during an IPSP. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. This is not an action potential. This is more like, I should have brought this slide. Do you remember how we were talking about the difference between hyperpolarization and the special thing that happens with depolarization? Depolarization has a threshold, and then you get to the action potential. But I talked about hyperpolarization, where you can give a hyperpolarizing pulse, and you get a little bit, little bit, little bit uh, uh, more hyperpolarization with each hyperpolarizing pulse. These. Um, uh, um, EPSPs and IPSPs are more like that. They simply follow the kind of input. They're not causing a huge um, change at the level of um, the cell body and axon. And we're going to get into that a little bit further. So let's uh, hopefully let me explain this. This will uh, give a little bit more clarity. Here we're looking at um, this is an example on this side of an EPSP, and here's an example of an IPSP. Let's focus on the EPSP first. Here, first we're worried, here's the presynaptic neuron. Here is the postsynaptic neuron. Here is the synapse right here. Presynaptically, I'm recording from this node of Ranvier, and I see an action potential. Action potential comes down, and it's causing, in this case, I just define it, uh, um, I, I'm telling you it's causing an EPSP. Now, I, I wish this was a little bit farther out. I want to make this clear. This is not recording at the node of Ranvier. This is just recording from a cell body part of the input structure. And what does the EPSP look like? It looks like a small depolarization, OK? Not an action potential. It's just a small depolarization. Why? Because there's not that many sodium channels there to stimulate. So you, you open them, but they open. There's a few of them. So you get a little bit of a depolarization. Here, a different thing is happening. This is an IPSP happening. Here is a cell causing an action potential. And this uh, uh, action potential here in this presynaptic cell is causing an IPSP. Here is the action potential. And then if I record in this level, um, right after the action potential fired, we see a hyperpolarization, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential um, at this level right here. OK. So what happens? How does the cell integrate this information? Yes, question. First you, and then you. Uh, why, why is it an action Yes, very good question. She's asking, this cell has an action potential, and it's causing an I EPSP here, and the same action potential from this different color cell is causing um, an IPSP. And I'm skipping over that right now, and the answer has to do with the channels that are at the other end of these different cells. They have different flavors, and that allows uh, this neuron to do something different to this cell than this neuron does, even though they're both using the same unit of communication 
the action potential. Okay, so I'm going to answer, be able to come back to that in the end. Tell me if you don't, if you still have a question about that at the end. Yes, was there a question? That was, my question. That was your question. Okay, any other questions? Okay, good. So, same action potentials causing EPSPs or IPSPs. I will explain that. We're still, we're just trying to focus on the EPSP and the IPSP and, and how those um, hyper, sorry, hyperpolarizations and depolarizations are being synthesized by a cell. Each individual neuron is like a little um, receiver unit. It's gathering all the information from all the inputs that it get, gets and trying to side, decide, should I fire an action potential or should I not fire an action potential? We talked about neurons in the brain that are sensitive to particular people's faces, okay? So um, this neuron that's sensitive to faces is trying to decide, do I see the face that I like? Should I fire and, and say to everybody, hey, my favorite face is being shown right now, or am I not sure? Or is it a face that is um, uh, very different from that face and I'm, I'm completely shut down, not doing anything at all? That's the kind of computation that individual neurons are doing through this medium of EPSPs and IPSPs, pushing the neuron further or uh, closer to or farther away from that um, threshold of an action potential. Okay. And so that's what I just said. Neurons perform information processing to integrate synaptic inputs. Um, a postsynaptic neuron will fire an action potential if a depolarization that exceeds its threshold reaches its axon hillock. So what we're trying to do to fire, if this neuron to, is to fire, we need enough of a depolarization to reach this part of the axon hillock to reach, um, we need the depolarization to get to threshold. That is uh, the, the, um, the way that this neuron is going to fire an action potential. Okay, so how does that happen? Well, um, EPSPs and IPSPs have particular characteristics. So here is an example. The circle is a schematic representation of um, the cell bodies and dendrites of a neuron. And here is the action potential deciding if I go on this side of the red, I fire action potentials. If I go down here, I'm hypopolarized and I'm, I'm quiet. And uh, this, this center dot right here is just at rest. So here, um, you, you can see I have um, um, excitatory inputs coming here and coming here and no inhibitory inputs. What we have to think about here is um, how strong those inputs are and how close to the axon hillock they are. Now imagine that it's not just a cell body, but there's a big dendrite going all the way out here, okay? If I have a, um, an excitatory postsynaptic potential here, it's causing a little depolarization, but that depolarization is diminishing as it gets close, farther and farther away from that input. And if it's really far away from the axon hillock, it can't stimulate. Uh, it, it can't um, cause a big stimulation. If you really want to be in control of that neuron, you want to be an excitatory input right next to the axon hillock. So when you say, hey, I'm firing right now, that has a big influence on whether that um, excitatory postsynaptic potential actually meets uh, uh, the criteria of uh, reaching the uh, threshold and fires an action potential, okay? And uh, the strongest inputs will have a one-to-one -one firing. Every time one cell fires, the next cell will fire. And that's because those inputs are very close to the axon hillock. It's not gonna be way out here on the dendrite because you remember uh, those electrical potentials will degrade over distance. So uh, you just add up how strong and how far away these inputs are to determine if you're the axon hillock, am I gonna fire or not? Here we see there's two positive, two excitatory postsynaptic potentials coming in at the same time. They're relatively close to the axon hillock, no um, hyperpolarization happening, and so we reach um, the threshold and we fire an action potential. However, you could also have a situation like this where you have uh, inhibition and excitation coming in. Uh, it looks like the inhibition is the closest to the axon hillock. Uh, we have both inhibition and excitation, and this just keeps it farther away from firing um, uh, with both 
excite, uh, sorry, inhibition and excitation, and so the cell is not firing right here in this configuration. Okay, the key name you need to know um, in terms of uh, people that, that contributed importantly to our understanding of how these neurons are integrating information is Sherrington, Sir Charles Sherrington in the 1930s won a Nobel Prize for his work on reflex actions, threshold, and summation of properties of the synapse. We're going to focus on his, uh, um, his principles of summation in the next few slides. Okay, there are two types of um, uh, potential summation, um, uh, local field summation in a cell that I want you to understand. The first form of summation is called spatial summation, and that is the summing of potentials that come from, uh, uh, from different parts of the cell, on different spatial parts of the entire, by cell I mean the cell body and the dendrite. Where are those inputs coming in, and how do they, they summate? If the overall sum of EPSPs and IPSPs can depolarize the cell at the axon hillock, an action potential will occur. We've already talked about that. So here is the same example. Here's spatial summation of um, now we have three excitatory inputs and only two inhibitory inputs. It looks like the excitatory one is uh, the closest to the axon hillock, so that's uh, providing a, a stronger input than, uh, say, this one that might be a little bit farther away. And we just reach the threshold here, uh, uh, turning the dial to the right here, getting an action potential. But this summation of all of these inputs across the spatial extent of the cell body and dendrites is called spatial summation uh, derived by Sherrington. The second kind of summation uh, that you need to be uh, familiar with, this is all covered in your book also very, very clearly, I think, it's called temporal summation. And that is the summing of potentials that arrive at the axon hillock at different times. Not very spaced out, but um, uh, at, at different times in close uh, uh, temporal proximity. And the idea here and the principle is the closer together in time that they arrive, the greater the summation and the possibility of an action potential. So here's the example. Here we have um, inputs coming. They're strong inputs, um, relatively far away, but they could, still, they could still reach the axon hillock. But there's three right in a row. And that's the uh, um, input that's reaching here. And what we see if we're recording in the cell body is that first action potential is depolarizing the cell. First EPSP does that. Second EPSP is kind of riding on the um, depolarizing wave of the first uh, action potential, gets up the uh, um, postsynaptic membrane even more. And then the third one is the one that uh, really gets uh, the neuron over threshold and then here at the axon hillock, you fire your action potentials. So it's an adding up of different positive negative inputs, either over space, spatial summation, or over time that's determining whether you get an action potential or not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so now we have finished the entire body of work of understanding um, electrical communication within the neurons. We have EPSPs, IPSPs summating in the cell bodies and the dendrites that are being um, uh, integrated or, um, um, at the axon hillock to decide, am I going to fire an action potential or am I not going to fire an action potential? And then we have either unmyelinated um, uh, um, uh, conduction of the action potential down the axon or we have fast saltatory conduction if the axon is myelinated that gets that axon all the way to the axon terminal. Okay, now we're going to move on to the second part of the talk, which is um, chemical communication that happens between the axon terminal of the presynaptic ax uh, neuron here and the postsynaptic dendrite of um, the dendrite of the postsynaptic neuron, um, if there was a neuron right here. Okay, and that. For that, we move to chemical transmission, and that happens at the synapse, shown synaptic, uh, schematically right here. Okay, so um, we have to jump back to the 30s, where the electrical properties 
of the neurons were well known. But it was unclear exactly how one electrical potential jumped to the next neuron. We could certainly uh, record here and record here and measure these electrical act, uh, uh, potentials, but it wasn't clear exactly how this electrical potential was getting from the axon um, terminal to the dendrite of one neuron to the dendrites of the other neuron. Was the electrical potential just jumping across the synapse? Was something else going on there? This was a big mystery. And again, in the 30s, we had uh, much more limited um, uh, uh, tools to be able to answer this question. The person that was able to answer this question won a Nobel Prize for his efforts, Otto Lowy, um, won a Nobel Prize for the discovery of chemical neurotransmission, and, uh, and specifically, he discovered the chemical neurotransmitter acetylcholine in 1936, a major uh, neurotransmitter that we'll be focusing a lot in next Monday's lecture on. Um, and so uh, in, in a, um, it's, uh, it tells a nice story at the beginning of the chapter, of this chapter, I think it's chapter three in your book, that he was trying to dis, um, um, figure out an experiment that would definitively show exactly what's going on there, whether there might be a chemical going across, some, some magical chemical, or it's electrical. And the idea for this experiment apparently came to him in a dream. And um, what he did was the following. It's illustrated in the next, um, uh, in the next slide. So he is stimulating a uh, nerve, the vagus nerve, one of the cranial nerves. What nerve is this? Vagus nerve is cranial nerve number 10. Very good. Vagus nerve is uh, um, contributing to both sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, responses. And uh, there is a vagus nerve um, uh, termination at the level of the heart. So here we're looking, working on the outside, but stimulating this peripheral cranial nerve. And what he did is they knew that when they stimulated the vagus nerve, and you looked at the contractions of the heart, if you stimulate the vagus nerve here, the contractions get really slow. The rate and force of heartbeats are reduced almost immediately. So they could do this. They know that was happening, but they didn't know exactly how it was happening. So here was Otto's um, uh, experimental design. He dissolved the heart in, um, um, uh, in fluid, and he stimulated the vagus nerve. And he stimulated until he got this uh, clear decrease in response. He took this fluid, and he siphoned it off, and he put it in another heart that was alive and beating. And what they found is they didn't even have to stimulate the vagus nerve, just siphoning off this um, liquid from this first heart into the second heart. After a little bit of a delay, slowed the heart down. This suggested that there was a chemical being released that was then in this fluid here that is still active and now, uh, without stimulation of the vagus nerve, is now affecting the heart here. He then uh, sucked off this liquid, um, figured out what was in there, and discovered the neurotransmitter protein acetylcholine. Okay, So that was the discovery that earned him a Nobel Prize. Let's talk about now, um, um, uh, let's see, 70, 80 years later, what we know about exactly what was happening um, at this heart synapse, but the same thing is happening at a, a axon to dendrite synapse all through your brain. Okay, here is um, uh, a schematic illustration, one from your book. And what we're starting with is here's our axon that we ended with. We have our action potentials coming down the axon that ends in a synaptic terminal. Okay, um, here is exactly this uh, the sequence of events. I'm going to tell you what happens, and we're going to look at the picture going back and forth. As I said, the action potential travels down the axon to the axon terminal. So we're getting this big burst of depolarization at the level of the axon terminal. What happens there is there's yet another special voltage-gated ion channel. This special voltage-gated ion channel is the voltage-gated calcium channel. Um, it opens, and calcium ions enter um, the post, uh, the presynaptic um, terminal. Why? 
because, again, going back to what's happening at rest, there's lots of calcium on the outside, a little bit of calcium on the inside. When, those, uh, when the uh, um, voltage gating ch calcium channel, channel opens, um, because of the force of diffusion going from high to low, you get an influx of calcium into the, um, uh, into the uh, presynaptic terminal, that is, the terminal at the end of the axon. So here we have our action potentials, lots of depolarization, activating. Here's our voltage-gated calcium uh, channel. Opening up, calcium comes in. What happens next? Calcium is critical for synaptic transmission um, because what calcium does is it allows these uh, little balls of neurotransmitter. So in the heart, in Lowy's experiment, um, it was little balls of neurotransmitter containing um, acetylcholine. So in the presynaptic terminal, you have little packets of um, neurotransmitters held in these little round um, uh, uh, um, uh, synaptic vesicles. And the calcium, what the calcium does is help those vesicles fuse with the presynaptic membrane that spits out all of its content into this synaptic cleft. Here the synapse, presynaptic element from the axon, postsynaptic element, this is either the cell body or a dendrite. And we have that very, very, very thin um, synaptic uh, cleft area. And what the calcium is doing is allowing these synaptic vesicles to fuse with this membrane and spit out its neurotransmitter. Okay, so we have voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium entry causes synaptic vesicles to fuse with the membrane and release transmitter into the cleft. Releasing the transmitter into the cleft. Okay, so what happens? We have transmitter into the cleft. Now we jump over to the postsynaptic side. Again, this is the cell body or the dendrite of the next cell. What's happening there? Transmitter. Uh, that is now spit out into the synaptic cleft, now binds to postsynaptic receptors that causes either an EPSP or IPSP. Now, how do you know whether it causes an EPSP or an IPSP? And the answer to that question is it depends on what kind of transmitters, what kind of, sorry, what kind of receptors you have on your postsynaptic membrane. Okay, you can completely change uh, uh, the, the functioning of a uh, synapse by changing the receptors um, uh, that are found on that, that postsynaptic membrane. Um, then, as we talked about uh, earlier, EPSPs or IPSPs spread towards the postsynaptic axon hillock. But then we have a, a, a cleanup uh, um, cleanup stage right here. You have all this transmitter spit out into the synaptic cleft. What's to, what's to um, um, stop the transmitter just from activating the uh, uh, receptor all the time, all the time, all the time? You also have a cleanup function. Transmitter that has been spit out because of the calcium coming into the presynaptic terminal is inactivated via two mechanisms. There is inactivation via degradation or inactivation via removal through a reuptake mechanism so that the presynaptic terminal can reuptake uh, this, this transmitter in here uh, and save it and repackage it into new synaptic vesicles. But you want to get rid of it because these are fast, um, fast acting events. And let's say there's lots of action potentials coming. You don't want to use up all your, um, all your receptors or all your, act, uh, all your transmitter in one action potential. You need to get it out, get those uh, receptors activated on the postsynaptic side, and then uh, clean up your, uh, your, um, uh, your transmitter in the synaptic cleft so that the next uh, action potential can cause the same kind of signal. Okay. Now, in the ne is this next section, we're going to talk about this key concept of it's the nature of these um, receptors that are determining whether you're going to get an EPSP or an IPSP. Now, what activates these receptors? 
the thing that activates the receptors is called a ligand. A ligand um, fits a receptor exactly. It's like a key going into a specific lock. So sometimes you can stick your key into a lock, but it's the wrong one. It won't activate anything. Only the right ligand or key can fit into a particular lock. That would be the receptor. So we have a key lock kind of analogy going here. There are two major kinds of ligands that you should know about. Endogenous ligands, endogenous keys, are neurotransmitters and hormones that are made by the brain that are acting in normal ways, in, in kind of natural ways in the brain. Those are endogenous ligands. Exogenous, exogenous ligands are other chemicals that come in and play the role of these endogenous ligands, but you could put a lot in there and, and really uh, hype up a system or block things off. We're going to talk about that later. And block off a system. Exogenous ligands are drugs and toxins from outside the body. Okay? So we're going to talk about uh, drugs and how they kind of commandeer the ligand system, the endogenous ligands of the brain in Monday's lecture. Okay. So now let's go back to a synapse and let's get specific about what exactly is being released. A common neurotransmitter that's in those synaptic vesicles and that fuses with the presynaptic membrane when, when the axon potential reaches the uh, presynaptic terminal, a common neurotransmitter is acetylcholine, that same uh, transmitter that Otto uh, discovered using his um, heart experiment, beating heart experiment. Acetylcholine is um, uh, abbreviated ACH. Um, and acetylcholine has ligand binding sites um, for acetylcholine um, in the receptor molecules in the postsynaptic membrane. So these receptors have particular kind of slots where the key, the acetylcholine, sits and activates this receptor. Now the trick here is that there are different kinds of acetylcholine receptors. Some of these uh, acetylcholine receptors can be excitatory. Excitatory acetylcholine receptors opens channels for sodium and potassium, um, causing a, uh, a depolarization. Or uh, other acetylcholine receptors can be inhibitory and open channels for chloride. Okay? So what you need to know, if I were going to tell you, is this going to cause um, an uh, excitatory postsynaptic potential or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential? You can't just know what transmitter um, the synapse is using. You have to know what flavor of receptor um, is in, those, um, uh, in that postsynaptic membrane. Okay? Because even the same acetylcholine on different synapses can be excitatory, causing EPSPs, or inhibitory, causing IPSPs. And again, think about it for a second. I know there's a lot of um, information we're going on, but you can imagine that this gives the brain so many different possible interactions. You can be positive or negative uh, and put different receptors and different neurotransmitters together to get different categories of responses huge wide range of responses because there's a huge wide range of both receptors and um, uh, neurotransmitters. Yes? So acetylcholine is excitatory? Yes, it is. Exactly. So acetylcholine is what's inside these synaptic vesicles. It is a transmitter that can be in presynaptic terminals. Okay? The receptors for these neurotransmitters, of which acetylcholine is one example, are found on the postsynaptic membrane. And here, these receptors for um, acetylcholine in a given synapse can either be excitatory, causing an EPSP, and that just means the structure of the um, receptor um, is such that when it's activated by acetylcholine, it lets calcium, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it lets sodium or potassium in, or inhibitory. Yes. Um, are all the receptors that is a good question. No, they're not always all the same. Usually. Uh, Either you get excitatory or inhibitory acetylcholine receptors. If acetylcholine is coming out here, then you get um, 
uh, either excitatory, all excitatory uh, acetylcholine receptors or all inhibitory acetylcholine receptors. But there's more than just the receptor for that synapse. There are modulatory receptors that may be uh, sensitive to hormones or other modulators that get, that, that get, um, uh, um, that get released uh, based on your level of excitation. If you're really scared, you're really nervous, or you're really relaxed. And it's that range of uh, receptor types and that, that wide range of different kinds of receptors that you can go in and do your drug therapies and tweak them in a different way, hopefully for the good, or sometimes you just abuse it and you get high all the time, and that happens too. But that's how it's happening at the postsynaptic membrane. Yes? What controls the makeup of the receptor? You mean the molecular structure of the receptor? Yeah, so um, that's a really good question. So receptors are complex protein structures. And it's really a little bit like architecture. You know, they are, let's, uh, let me just, um, here is a protein structure of an acetylcholine receptor. And uh, the makeup of this particular uh, excitatory acetylcholine receptor is such that when two acetylcholine molecules sit in these two um, uh, little slots right here, the, the channel opens up. What happens to the channel? It is sensitive to sodium. Sodium goes through. The, uh, the inhibitory acetylcholine receptor has a completely different protein structure. Uh, it really is you just build it differently and make it sensitive to different things, and that's what's happening. There's a huge and really, really fascinating um, uh, branch of neuroscience, a kind of uh, micro uh, uh, molecular neuroscience that studies the protein structures and how these are, are these individual proteins are built and folded. And there, they can go and understand the architecture and then cut little parts out to not just flood the brain, uh, brain with drugs, but to engineer new receptors that may do things that we really need it to do to be sensitive to, I don't know, cancer, uh, um, uh, uh, cancer helping drugs, things like that. But it really is a whole nother world here, a little, little architectural wonder, each one of these receptors. Any other questions? Yes. Right, right. That's a, so he's wondering what determines um, in kind of a developmental sense, is that what you're thinking about? Whether a neuron becomes excitatory or inhibitory? Yeah, well, a lot of that is determined by just the um, kind of the genetic and DNA uh, uh, blueprint that's, that's there. Uh, but there's a lot of give and take that happen within development. And actually, you can, you, you can screw around with development. Have you heard of um, sensitive periods? So sensitive periods are periods for, for example, in language. If you have a little baby and you don't speak to the baby uh, in a particular critical period, that baby will never learn language. Why? Because during that time, it's, it's um, synapses are developing and it's taking in this uh, auditory information and, and giving meaning to it. There is huge amounts of developmental pruning, both excitation and inhibition going on to help the development of language. It also happens with sight. If you don't get certain, um, uh, um, or auditory, if you don't get, uh, um, same thing with language, if you don't get uh, exposed to certain kinds of sounds. So babies growing up in China hear very, very different sounds than babies growing up in the United States. And babies in China have a hard time hearing differentiations between certain vowels, uh, and that has to do with the developmental pruning that takes place. Um, is, that, is that, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Any other questions? All excellent questions. Okay, great. So let's go back. Okay, so we talked about endogenous and exogenous ligands. 
Um, all right, can be excitatory and inhibitory. And so we were at this, uh, just an example of the, the protein structure of an excitatory um, receptor molecule for, uh, I'm sorry, receptor protein for acetylcholine. You have two acetylcholines that uh, go into these two slots. And once they're both there, you get um, uh, an opening pore that, uh, that is now sensitive to, that allows sodium to go through. And sodium is, of course, um, uh, high concentration on the outside, low concentration on the inside. So by the force of diffusion, you're going down here. And this causes a depolarization, causing an EPSP here. This is in the um, postsynaptic membrane. OK, so now uh, uh, two more important um, concepts to understand when we're talking about neurotransmitters and receptors. These are concepts uh, having to do with different kinds of neurotransmitter-like molecules. Molecules that act like the transmitter, the neurotransmitter at a receptor, but are not the neurotransmitter itself, are called agonists of a receptor. A lot of drugs are neurotransmitter agonists. They're, they work just like uh, the neurotransmitter itself, and you, you put a lot of drug in your system, and it's just like flooding the system with this kind of drug, but in an artificial way. That is an agonist. It's working just like the neurotransmitter to do whatever it does, either letting sodium in or letting chloride in. Now, molecules that interfere with or prevent the action of the transmitter at its receptor are called antagonists. Antagonists to this receptor may fit right in here, but at the same time they're fitting in here, they block the sodium channel. So this receptor becomes moot. It's not working anymore. Acetylcholine can't go in there and uh, can't, can't go into their little slots, and sodium can't go through the pore anymore. That's what a receptor antagonist would do. Some drugs are also receptor antagonists, depending on whatever uh, function um, you want to have. And uh, those are very complex. And we'll talk about that in the drugs and the brain lecture on Monday. OK, agonists uh, um, are, are, um, are mimicking the neurotransmitter. Antagonists are blocking uh, the receptors and blocking the workings of a particular neurotransmitter. Um, so now, uh, the last, I think, uh, dis distinction before we kind of wrap it up um, is um, I need to tell you about two different types of receptors. The type of receptors uh, and channels that we've talked about so far have really been um, mainly ionotropic receptors. That is just like this acetylcholine receptor is an ionotropic receptor. What does that mean? Ionotropic, ionotropic receptors open when bound by a transmitter. Um, it's also called a ligand-gated ion channel. And it let, lets um, ions through. So ionotropic, it lets different ions through. That's, that's the uh, um, definition of that type of receptor. It's fast. It works. There's uh, large numbers of them in the brain. But it's not the only major type of receptor. The second type that we haven't talked about so far, but will come up in the future, is called a metabotropic receptor. Metabotropic, metabotropic receptors recognize the transmitter, but uh, don't immediately activate um, ions or let ions through. Instead, they activate what's called G proteins. Let's look to see what that structure looks like. Oh, sorry. Here's the ionotropic receptor. We already looked at that. G proteins, um, what are G proteins? G proteins are first messengers, sometimes open channels, or may activate other chemicals to affect ion channels. Um, this chemical is known as a second messenger, uh, and it amplifies the effects of the G protein, may lead to changes in membrane potential. The important thing here for these um, uh, metabotropic receptors is you have to understand they're much slower than the ionotropic receptors. Let's just look at this. Here is an example of a G protein coupled receptor. It's slower. It's a metabotropic receptor. Here is the metabotropic receptor right here. Here is that neurotransmitter sitting uh, that, that activates this. And what happens here is a second messenger, a G protein, is activated. Um, when this 
slot is filled, the G protein down here on the inside of the neuron becomes activated. This G protein then floats over and activates um, usually another ionotropic receptor. So it has to go through these multiple steps here. And yeah, you still may get ions coming in, but uh, it's a much slower process, okay? And, uh, but interestingly, you can mess with this process in, in different ways by, um, uh, uh, by activating the G proteins, by slowing down the G proteins, uh, and you can imagine different ways you can uh, slow down or even speed up uh, the effect of these metabotropic receptors. Okay, so we've reached the end of our big review of um, communication, the major mode of communication. And I want to end by trying to review um, all the different concepts that we've gone over. We talked about two types of communication that can happen in neurons. Electrical, uh, uh, electrical activity and electrical communication uh, occurring in the form of EPSPs, IPSPs, and summation at the level of the cell body and the uh, uh, dendrites. And then the action potential originating right here in the axon hillock coming all the way down to the axon terminal. At the axon terminal, we turn to chemical neurotransmission. Um, neurotransmitters uh, floating across that very, very thin synaptic cleft and activated, activating receptors on the postsynaptic um, side that can either be excitatory, causing EPSPs, or inhibitory, cause, causing IPSPs. And then we start the process all over again because um, we're at the level of, of um, integration again. And that can be summarized in one example, and that is the knee-jerk reflex. Everybody knows what the knee-jerk reflex is. You've all had it at the doctor's office. Uh, they bang your knee right there, um, and your, your foot comes up. And here is the very, oh, this is a very fast uh, response. The speed of transmission in all of the axons um, involved in this, um, in this response is 100 meters per second. And the total time of the response is 40 milliseconds. So very, very quick. I bet you didn't even know that you were demonstrating your fast neurotransmission by the simple motor reflex. But let's take it step by step so we can review all the different steps that we've talked about. Um, this, this reflex arch that we're going to define is an example of a neural chain, a simple series of neurons. Um, and the knee-jerk reflex is really a circuit for what's called the stretch reflex that we're going to go over in much more detail in the motor part of, um, in the motor lecture coming up after our sensory systems. This knee-jerk reflex consists of one sensory neuron, one motor neuron, and two synapses. That's all. So let's look to see how these three elements um, sensory motor, mo uh, neuron, motor neuron, and two, two synapses in 40 milliseconds can allow our uh, knee-jerk reflex to happen. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, just a couple more facts. The knee-jerk reflex is extremely fast. Axons are myelinated and large, the fastest you can get. Sensory cells synapse directly onto motor neurons, so there's only, as I said, two neurons involved here in this, in this reflex. And all of the synapses use fast ionotropic synapses. So the very fastest you can get. OK, so what's happening here? When the doctor hits the front of your knee, what he's doing, he's activating a sensory um, element in your quadricep muscle. It's called the stretch receptor. He's activated artificially by banging that little uh, hammer against your knee. But what that stretch receptor does is it sets off action potentials in a sensory neuron that's innervating that stretch receptor within your quadricep, OK? And so look at this neuron right here. It's a unipolar, newly, unipolar sensory neuron. The cell body is right here. Here is its um, a dendritic component. Here is its axonal component. This is a sensory neuron. Uh, these cell bodies are in a specialized structure that we talked about right next to the spinal cord. Anybody remember what that is? They are in a ganglion next to the cell, next to the um, uh, spinal cord. 
Anybody remember what that's called? Yes? Dorsal, dorsal root ganglion, very close. Okay, so these cell bodies are in the dorsal root ganglion. And also, if you remember, when we were talking about different categories of, of shapes of neurons, these unimodal, uh, unipolar sensory neurons, uh, we said, were mainly located in sensory systems. This one is in um, the cell bodies in the dorsal root ganglion. So just to give you a visual where this cell body sits. So I have my dorsal root ganglion right next to my spine, probably down here because it's innervating my leg muscle. Um, the, uh, the hit of the, um, uh, of the hammer uh, stimulates this, um, uh, stimulates the muscle stretch receptor that sets off action potentials that go very quickly. This is a thick myelinated axon, and the action potentials go from the dendrite directly to the axon, and they synapse on directly onto a motor neuron within the spinal cord. So it doesn't even come all the way up to the brain. This is a motor neuron in um, the ventral root of the spinal cord. This is a synapse that uses glutamate. So we have our action potential coming down. We have um, uh, the action potential reaching the end of the axon terminal. Calcium floods in. Calcium does what? What is it doing again? depolarizes, but what else does it do to what's inside there? It what? Pushes the vesicles? Causes the vesicles to fuse. Very good. Both of you are right. Um, causes the, the calcium coming in the presynaptic terminal is causing the vesicles to fuse. These vesicles happen to contain a very common neurotransmitter glutamate that we're going to talk about on Monday. Um, that glutamate uh, uh, swims across the very, very thin synaptic cleft. Uh, there are uh, glutamate receptors in the postsynaptic cleft that are excitatory. These are letting sodium in the cell, causing an EPSP that we see right here. That EPSP is quite strong. It's a small neuron. It's near the axon hillock. And so that EPSP reaches um, the threshold of this, uh, of this motor neuron that causes action potentials generated at the axon hillock. The axon goes back, and these motor neurons are innervating the same muscle where the sensory stretch receptors came from. And so you get um, actually acetylcholine here um, it, uh, that is a neurotransmitter from the motor axon to the muscle itself. We'll talk about exactly how muscles contract. That acetylcholine is contracting your, uh, um, your quadricep muscle that's causing that kick right there. So in two neurons and two synapses, this synapse here and this synapse here, and in 40 milliseconds, you get um, an entire reflex loop illustrating both the electrical and the chemical um, uh, components of neurotransmission. So make sure you understand all of these components. It's a great example to make sure you understand all of this that I've tried to integrate and stitch together. And um, I'll see you on Monday for Drugs in the Brain.